Good morning. Welcome to Prepare the Way Morning Devotions. We are beginning a brand new uh, study today. Uh, we're talking about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, as it's seen in the Gospel of Matthew. Of the four Gospels, Matthew uh, talks about how Jesus talked about the kingdom more than anybody. Now, Jesus talked about the kingdom of heaven in all the Gospels, but we just have the most of it in the Gospel of Matthew. And so, you know, uh, we want to talk about what does this mean, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven? Uh, is it just when you die, go to heaven? Is that is that all there is to it? As wonderful as that is, I would tell you today that the kingdom of heaven is even greater than that. That the kingdom of heaven is not just the reality of what happens when you die. The kingdom of heaven is the reality in which you live now as a believer in Jesus Christ. When you become a follower of Jesus, and I'm sorry about the slow connection here, when you become a follower of Jesus, uh, you enter a kingdom. You don't just enter into a religion. You, there is a religion of Christianity. There, there are religious things that we do. It's not merely religion. Uh, it's not enough just to say it's not a religion. It's a relationship either. That's not really adequate. Um, it sounds like you got a boyfriend or something. Uh, no, to, when we talk about Christianity, we talk about the gospel of the Lord Jesus. We're not just talking about a religion, and we're not just talking about a relationship. We're talking about a reign, a rule, and that's a, so, such a different thing. And so Jesus talked about this as much as he talked about anything uh, in his teachings, and so it must be pretty important. It will shift. Listen. Listen, before we pray and get going here, I just want to tell you how, why I'm so excited about this. It, it will shift the whole way you look at being a Christian. It, it really will. If you look at yourself as, I'm a member, I'm a Christian, I got saved, and I got forgiven, and I'm going to heaven when I die, uh, well, you're, you know that's great, and it's true. It's true. But you're missing about three-fourths of what God called you to. You know, he didn't just call you to go to pie in the sky when you die. As great as it is, and I'm looking forward to the fullness of the kingdom. In Revelation, it talks about it. In Revelation 21 and 22, the fullness of the kingdom. And, and, and what a beautiful thing it is. And, and how the kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. But friend, let me tell you something. If you look at yourself as a member of religion, you're going to live one way. If you look at yourself as a citizen of a kingdom, you're going to live a different way. I'm going to tell you what. It'll shift everything. It'll change the way you raise your family. It'll change the way you spend your money. It'll change the way you do your job. It will change the way you look at your life, yourself. It'll change everything. When you see that you're not part of just a dead religion, you're part of a kingdom. And that kingdom is moving. It's advancing. It's growing. It's doing something. It's active. And you're part of it as a Christian. And you need to get involved. A lot of Christians aren't even involved. They're just kind of like sitting on the front pew waiting to die. We Listen, the, especially today, uh, you know, in the world we're living in today, we're seeing the clash of the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of Christ in, in ways we haven't seen in quite a while, in this part of the world anyway. Uh, other parts of the world have been seeing it for years. And we're seeing it more. And so what does that mean for us? How do we live in light of the kingdom? Anyway, I have prefaced enough. Let's pray and let's get into it. We're going to be in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, bow with me, please. Father, in Jesus' name, we just come thankful. Thankful to be part of your kingdom. Thankful that you're the king of the kingdom and yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that your kingdom has come. And your kingdom is coming, and your kingdom will come. And Lord, you're the king, and uh, we are, we honor you, and we we uh, we salute you, and we we reverence you, and we love you, and we celebrate our king, uh, the king who reigns forever and ever. And Lord, we're your citizens of your kingdom, and we we just give you glory and we give you honor. Now, Lord, teach us. Teach us how to live as kingdom people with a kingdom mindset and a kingdom way. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, it's exciting. I love it. Look, look with me. Matthew's Gospel. Um, in Matthew, we're going to look at, we're not going to go verse by verse the whole Gospel of Matthew. That would take us forever. It'd be worth it. 
But I want to focus on a thematic study of Matthew where we're just going to talk about everywhere Jesus mentioned the kingdom or everywhere the kingdom is mentioned in relation to Jesus throughout Matthew's gospel. Still going to take a long time. It's going to be great. But that's where we're focusing. And so I want you to, to look with me. Matthew chapter 4, uh, starting at verse 12 down to verse 17. And we're going to talk about this first place where we see Jesus mentioning the kingdom. Um, in chapter 4, verse 12, it begins, Now when he heard, Jesus heard, that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea, the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land, of, here's, here's the prophecy, here's just part of it. Um, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, there we go. It's, now, let me just say, here's the theme for today. The theme is just when you thought it was over. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. I want to begin by going back to Isaiah chapter 9, where we read those first two verses. And I want to show you what else it says. Uh, you'll, be, this, you'll find this familiar, especially if you paid attention during the Christmas season. After those two verses, it says, For the yoke of his burden and the staff... Wait a minute, let me back up to verse 3. You have multiplied the nation... You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. Here's where it gets familiar. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end, and on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it. Now, this, <coughs> this prophecy is about the coming king and the coming messianic kingdom. This was the hope of Israel for centuries. They were praying and still are, incidentally, for the coming of the Messiah and his kingdom. And in that kingdom, there would be a king who would rule on the throne of David forever and ever and ever and ever. And Jesus, we know, is that king. And he reigns on that throne. And so here's the thing, is that, that Jesus is beginning to announce the coming of the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? The short definition of the kingdom of God is simply this, the rule and reign of God. Wherever God's authority and power are being recognized, that's where the kingdom is. That, that's true. It's an invisible kingdom that runs counter to this world's kingdom, that's why in Revelation, when, it's, when it comes in its fullness, it says the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. That's the end game, isn't it? That's the end game, that one day all the kingdoms will submit to the king, Jesus Christ. Let the nations rage all they want now. Let them try with all their games and toys and wars and, and stuff to try to create their own kingdom and their own security. But the coming of the king, one day he's coming to rule and to reign. But the thing is, is that when, as the Jews were praying for this kingdom to come, they were in a time of struggle. They were in a time of being oppressed by the Roman Empire. The idea of a coming king just didn't seem very feasible. They felt like it was over. And here's where it's, here's, but Jesus comes at their darkest moment to be that light that the Gentiles would see. Because the people were under Roman oppression at this time in history. John the Baptist had come saying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. 
make his path straight. Every mountain is going to be knocked flat. Every valley is going to be lifted up. And everybody's going to see the glory of God. Even John the Baptist wasn't quite clued in exactly how the kingdom was going to come. So, John, But John was a voice of hope. And people were coming by the thousands to be baptized, to repent of their sins, to prepare for the coming kingdom. In their minds, though, here's how it was going to work. We're going to repent. We're going to get cleaned up. We're going to get ready. And King David is going to come in, or the second King David is going to come in riding in glory and wipe out Rome and establish Israel as the eternal kingdom on the earth. And they didn't under, they, that's what they thought was going to happen. Even when Jesus later on rode into Jerusalem, they expected him to come in and just kill Pontius Pilate, wipe out the Romans, and start the revolution. But that's not what he did. He rode in on a donkey. He rode in in humility, preparing to give his life on the cross. And that totally confused everybody. And so Jesus, but we're not there yet. We're back up. At the beginning of his ministry, Jesus begins at the time when it seemed most hopeless. It says, when he heard that John had been arrested. In other words, King Herod had arrested John for speaking the truth. He had arrested the voice of the forerunner, the, the Elijah who was to come before Messiah. He had silenced him, or so he thought, and he put him in prison. When the people saw John arrested by the authorities, it must have been uh, like a punch to the gut. It must have made them feel like all hope was lost. Once again, Rome has silenced a voice of hope. Once again, those in power have crushed the voice of the oppressed once again. And, and, you know, that I can imagine many people just going home and shaking their heads and thinking, well, we thought he was the one. We thought he was it, but now he's in prison. You know, he'll be dead in a couple of days. Uh, you know, and so it just must have been terrible. And for Jesus, that was his cousin. And for Jesus, that must have been uh, so hard because Jesus felt the anguish and even though he knew the plan he felt the pain of it and the brokenness of it and he felt the oppression of the people and so it says that's why he withdrew into Galilee he just pulled back maybe he had to go off and just spend some time with his father and, and say okay it's time to kick it into gear now he had been baptized he had been tested in the wilderness and now he's coming to proclaim the kingdom and here's what I what I love Here's what I love, is that Jesus came along at the time when they thought it was over. At the time they thought it was all finished. In fact, that's what Isaiah's prophecy indicates. That that prophecy in Isaiah 9 is at a time when people would feel the most hopeless. And Isaiah would say, oh no. Nope, just when you thought it was over, that's when the king will come. And so Jesus comes to fulfill that at the perfect moment, just when it's darkest just when the last voice of hope has seemingly been crushed, Jesus says this in verse 17, from that time, from that moment of, of hopelessness and darkness, from that moment Jesus began to preach, saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What great words of hope. What great, don't, don't move past this too quickly. This was the first message of Jesus. This was the first proclamation to come from the mouth of Messiah. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That means it's right here. It's on you. It's not someday anymore. Someday is today. And Jesus comes at the time when we think it's the worst moment. When we think all hope is lost. That's when he comes saying, oh no, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Isn't that great news today? Because I know that you and I often feel like we're in a time when most people are turning away from God, when uh, leadership is most questionable, and we have the, I think it may be the lowest confidence in national leadership I have seen in my lifetime. It may be that even in institutions we have low confidence and in and many things that we've once trusted in that we have hard time trusting in and we look around and we see how many 
How many have said, you know, uh, there's just no hope. It's over. Church in America, it's dead. Christianity, we're post-Christian. We're no more gospel. Just forget it. They're going to start uh, shutting us down and silencing us. And they're going to start telling us that we can't preach anymore. Let me tell you something. <laughs> you, we ain't even started yet. We have, you know, God is bringing us into a time of refining. He is shaking things loose. He is tearing away the fake religiosity that we have put up with for decades and he is calling us to be holy he is calling us to be righteous he's calling us to be prophetic he's calling us to be powerful he's calling to be bold and speak the truth and not try to cater to the culture there's going to be a line drawn in the sand very soon that between those who would preach a gospel of compromise with the culture and those who are staying true to the message of Jesus. Those who are, who are using the gospel for money and those who are being spent for the sacrifice of the kingdom. Those who are turning, trying to, to turn um, our, our churches into to just another social organization to feed into the ego of a culture. To those who are saying, nope, we are the bride of Christ. And the bride is turning her gaze back to the groom. Let me say that again. We are in a day when the bride is turning her gaze back to the groom. We've been looking around. We've, we've looked at popularity. We've looked at politics. We've glanced over at power. We've flirted with with immorality we flirted with idolatry but we've we're turning listen i love this he's turning us back to the groom the bridegroom he's turning us back to a pure devotion and love of the lord jesus christ uh he's turning us and it, it, there's going to be some struggle now I just, you got to understand this because there're going to be some people who don't like this there's going to be some people more interested in their own position, their own power, their own reputation than they are in following him. And so, and sometimes that will hit us all. We'll all have to struggle with that. But the kingdom is at hand in a, in, in, a, in a great way in our culture today. Just when you thought it was over. Just when you thought we're done. We can't go any farther. We're out of vogue. We're out of style. We're, we're finished just when you thought. Jesus comes saying, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Man, that's awesome stuff. Isn't that great? That every and you look at history, and I won't I won't rehearse all of history for you. You can do that yourself. You look at history and all the times when just about the time when we thought all hope was lost, the gospel lit like a fire and turned up and turned up the flame. I believe we're in a time like that right now. I don't want you to get discouraged today, friend. I don't want you to give it up, friend. I don't want you to think, oh, you know, it's over. I might as well hunker down and hope for the Jesus to return. You get out in the field. The harvest is going to come. The harvest is coming. But it's going to come from people who are who are filled with the Holy Spirit, devoted to the Word of God, and in love with the Lord Jesus Christ and who love him and follow him wherever he goes and who are interested in the things that he is interested in and who aren't afraid to go after the things he goes after and who are willing to flip the tables that he flipped and, and walk the walk that he walked and love the way he loved. Listen, and that's a great challenge for all of us. All of us, none of us are worthy of that. But his grace is sufficient and he's going to bring it. Look, let me tell you something. Here's what he says though. In verse 17, this is key. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What is that? The, the key the key to discovering the kingdom. You might say, I, I look around, I don't see the kingdom. I see problems, I see disease, I see war, I see difficulty. You know what he's saying? Turn around. Because the people listening to him preach must have said, Who is that guy? Who is that guy? He, he was hanging out with John. Now John's in jail. I guess they'll arrest him next. You know, what, what's going on here? And Jesus says, Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. He must have been excited. He must, you know, I, I, don't, I, don't want any, I don't want any kind of cold... Uh, these, these movies and, and stuff that make Jesus out to be some kind of cold, you know, nothing. No, Jesus was on fire. He was a preacher. And he came and looked, repent. The kingdom of heaven's at hand. It's here. Now, so, but the cornerstone of it is repentance. The, the key 
to see in the kingdom is repentance. And why is that? Because the kingdoms of this world are in opposition to the kingdom of God. And if we've been going along with the kingdoms of this world, we've been, in other words, following the value systems of this world, buying into the, uh, the ethics of this world, buying into the uh, desires of this world, and we've kind of been flowing along with that. Some of us have even tried to portray Jesus as being okay with that. And we we've tried to kind of go along with the politics and the power and the money and the and the reputations and the all the stuff of this world and and you know and 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 if you're gonna see the kingdom you're gonna have to turn around that's what repent means it means turn around that means you're gonna have to look in a different direction you're gonna have to look in the opposite of what this world values you're not gonna find the kingdom of heaven going the way of this world. The, the Bible says, don't love the world or the things of the world. And it says three things. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And if most of us have built our religion on those things. We want it to look good, we want it to feel good, and we want it to make us uh, in, in good standing. We want, we want it all to be about us. And so that's a worldly perspective. And so Jesus calls us to turn our back on that. He calls us to turn away from the, 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 the pleasure-seeking of this world, to turn away from the immorality of this world, to turn away from the greed of this world and the, the politics of violence and self-interest of this world, to turn away from the selfishness of this world, to turn away from the, the worship of pagan things and vain things of this world and turn and follow him to turn and follow the king and Jesus has a different ethic the kingdom of this world so the kingdom of God isn't just a nice term the kingdom of God means that God that it's a reality that you step into when you're born Jesus said it like this let me, let me put it this way when Jesus was talking in John chapter 3 he's talking to Nicodemus and he said unless you're born again you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he said, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of heaven. Now, he's not just talking about the ultimate kingdom when you die. The kingdom reality right now. There's an invisible kingdom full of the blessing and power and love and mercy and justice of God. Full of the rule of God and the reign of God where the will of God is done. That's why he told the disciples to pray your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the prayer of the disciple. So Jesus said, look, if you, you've got to get born again before you can even see it. Because you can't recognize the kingdom of heaven unless you've got that spiritual rebirth. And you sur surely aren't going to enter into it. You can't walk into the reality of God's invisible kingdom until you're born again. It's not something you can join by signing on the dotted line. It's something you enter into, you become when you're born again. The, the beginning of the kingdom begins with repentance of sin and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The, if you want to enter into God's kingdom, now in God's kingdom, there are, there's healing, there's provision, there's power, there's forgiveness, there's compassion, there's strength, there's hope, there's life. In the midst of darkness, there is light. When you, you can't enter that kingdom... You can't even see it until you're born again. When you're, when you're born again, suddenly you begin to understand things. You begin to realize where God's at work all around you. You begin to see the power of prayer, for example. And when you see that God really does answer prayer and God really does work in our lives, you get to see the work of the Holy Spirit. You get to hear the Holy Spirit speaking to us. You get the Word of God, the Bible, becomes a living thing. Those who study the Bible without the help of the Holy Spirit are making a vain attempt. Uh, you can't really get hold of what's in this Word without the help of the Spirit because He brings it to life for you and He makes it real for you. You can't walk in the peace that you long for unless you walk with the Prince of Peace and you're born again. How do you get born again? Let's start there. How do you enter into the kingdom? He said, repent for the kingdom of heaven. you got to turn around. In other words, look. Repentance simply means turning around, changing your mind from the way you were thinking and the way you were living 
to changing your mind to living by faith in Jesus. First, you were living by faith in yourself, faith in this world, faith in the things of this world. And where did it get you? It hasn't gotten you anywhere of frustration and pain and sorrow and suffering. But when you turn to him, you turn and repent of your sins. You say, Lord, you know, I'm sorry for my sins. Jesus died on the cross to make that birth possible. When he died on the cross, he paid the penalty for your sins. He, he, he made you, it made it possible for you to be forgiven by a holy God because our sins bring us into judgment, don't they? All of us will pay for our sins. All of us will be accountable for our sins unless we receive Christ who has paid the price for us. Christ opened the door of the kingdom of heaven when he died on the cross and rose from the dead on the third day. So here's the thing. How do you enter the kingdom? How do you enter the kingdom? Well, it's very simple. First, you just have to admit that you've been going the wrong way. Can this be? Can I make it real simple for you? The way you've been living, living by your own truth, has gotten you nowhere but falsehood. Your own truth is a lie. And you've got to accept that. Your, your way is not God's way. Uh, following your heart has led you only away from God. Following your own, because your heart's sinful, your heart is selfish, your heart's prideful. It's only going to lead you where you want to go. It's not going to listen to God. And you haven't been listening to God. You've been living your own life. And so here's the thing. It's time to turn around. It's time to say, you know what? I can't live this way anymore. I'm not living for that kingdom anymore. That kingdom of darkness and death and hopelessness and anger and hostility. And even with all the pleasures that come with it, it's just not worth it. I've got to turn around. Turn to him turn and say, Lord Jesus, I'm, I, I turn to you right now. I repent of my sins. Do a list of all the sins you're aware of. You don't need me telling you. You know that lying is a sin. You know lust is a sin. You know violence and hatred are sin. You know those kind of things. Look at the Ten Commandments. Those are That's a basic short list of things God that we all tend to do. And God doesn't want you doing those things. And so turn to him and get in your prayer with God and say, God, I'm sorry for these things and I turn from these. I don't want to live this way anymore. Second is to believe in the Lord Jesus because even if you repent, you'll be back at it unless you put your faith in Jesus because it's Jesus who not only forgives us, he gives us a special gift that helps us live the new life. It's called the Holy Spirit. When you repent of your sins and you believe in the Lord Jesus, he gives you a wonderful gift. Peter said in Acts 2.38, he said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The, the Holy Spirit is the one who comes to live within you and give you a new life. And that comes by invitation. You, you ask him, Lord, forgive me. Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, save me. And, and Lord, make me new. When you ask him to do that, he gives you that wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit becomes the counselor, the helper, the one who walks with you and leads you and shows you how to follow Christ and shows you how to live. And then that you're born again at that moment. But how do you begin to grow? Well, you, you get into a church. Don't listen to those uh, foolish people who say you don't need that. Yes, you do. Get connected with some other true believers and begin to worship with him because there's something about worship and fellowship with others that's strengthening. Tell the pastor of that church that you've become a, a born-again follower of Jesus and you want to grow. That pastor will help you. Um, if they don't help you, go find another church. Um, read your Bible. Open it up. Uh, stay with us here and come to prepare the way every morning. And, and let's read the scripture together. And read and learn and ask God to teach your heart and spirit how to follow Jesus. And begin just to get to know him. Begin to talk to him about everything and pray for yourself, pray for others, pray for people around you. Begin to have conversation with God and listen. He'll speak to you. He'll guide you through his word and through worship and through those basic disciplines. And those are like the baby steps. They help us get going in our walk with the Lord. And finally, tell other people what he's done for you. And, and love people. The key is loving one another. The, the main thing of being a Christian is loving each other. But guys, all of this is only possible when we're born again. Jesus said, look, the kingdom is at hand. That rule of God, that reign of God. And you might say, well, how do I know the kingdom is real? Everywhere, listen, everywhere you see forgiveness happening, you're seeing the kingdom of God. Everywhere you're seeing compassion you're seeing the kingdom of God. Everywhere you're seeing somebody give hope, you're seeing the kingdom of God. Everywhere you're seeing Jesus glorified and honored, 
you're seeing the kingdom of God. I believe that the church, your church, if you're a Christian and you got a church, let me tell you what your church is. Your church is not a religious business. Your church is not a Hollywood program. Your church is an outpost for the kingdom of God. It is an earthbound outpost for the kingdom of God. And it is part of a global network of churches. Forget your denomination. I mean, they're okay to have as, a, as part of your identity kind of deal. But I'm going to tell you something. Your church is connected to every other church on the planet. You are part of the largest network in all of the planet, all the world, all of history. And you're connected to every Christian, Bible-believing, cross-carrying, loving, spirit-led Christian church. We're all parts of the outpost of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is all over the place. Uh, when you're seeing people minister to the homeless, you're seeing the kingdom of heaven. When you're seeing people cross racial ba boundaries with love, you're seeing the kingdom of heaven. When you're seeing people preach the gospel boldly, you're seeing the kingdom of heaven. When you're seeing miracles of healing happen, you're seeing the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus, he yes, he still does those miracles. He heals the sick, raises the dead, casts out demons. He delivers from sin and the power of it. He delivers from the demonic. He overcomes evil. Wherever you see those things happening in Jesus name you're seeing the kingdom of heaven ask God to open your eyes and to show you the kingdom it's at hand what we've got to learn to do is turn around here's the bottom line of this message today you cannot keep going your way and see the kingdom of heaven at the same time you've got to turn around and start going his way and the moment you begin to go his way everything starts becoming clear God bless you today. Go in peace.